um, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Oliver Tim, who of course you all know, or at least most of you do know, because he was teaching here last year, and we thought uh, to make a case for how good he is, it was important to have him back also this year. Um, that of course is part of the reason. The other reason is that metropolitan architecture, uh, as we try to figure out what it ever could be, um, we, uh, in parallel, as you know, with the studio project as it is evolving, in parallel with the kind of dialogue with our unit here, the Martin Lavalle unit, and the one uh, at the ETH, uh, there's also this third, I would say, parallel, which is, of course, these four kind of positions, you could say, uh, which we hope we have carefully chosen, starting with Christoph van Herwey trying to figure out what on earth Metropolitan uh, would have been in relationship to Freud. Uh, um, you know, Paris, Tokyo, um, to kind of a uh, hyper individual and a kind of uh, organized society. Um, and Bart, so, uh, if I say to summarize perhaps a little bit, and I think it was a very good way to start because it kind of gave a, uh, um, a kind of theoretical context, if you want, uh, of the studio, uh, which we could either take uh, or, or leave. Um, then we had, of course, um, Francois Charbonnet. Um, who, who showed his uh, highly idiosyncratic machine-like uh, architecture, uh, which we felt somehow was touching uh, upon the, the, the more high-tech-like of desires uh, we might have here in the studio. Um, and I think he very much engaged in that. Um, we had uh, Fabrizio uh, Balabio, um, maybe as from a historian's perspective, young historian's perspective, um, introducing this uh, strategy of uh, San Felice and how he, San Felice himself, almost with only one device, and I think the word device here is probably appropriate, uh, this uh, particular uh, kind of shared staircase uh, was able to transform um, an idea of a somehow individual collective of these big uh, building blocks in, in Napoli, uh, Baroque Napoli. And so we end with, uh, with um, Oliver uh, and why Oliver? Because we think that he's uh, personally, and of course together with Andre, the one only architect today who's able to resolve the problem of housing uh, in an interesting way. Uh, and that exactly because they try to be as uninteresting uh, as possible. So um, for that reason, uh, we thought that was probably close to what we could understand as metropolitan architecture in housing. Something like, uh, or something closest to, uh, I would say, an oxymoron. Uh, so I, I leave the word to uh, Oliver. Uh, thanks for coming. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the um, invitation. And uh, I don't know exactly how much time I have, but we have to start at uh, an hour. So I will do it relatively quick. Yeah? So uh, and the issue um, I would like to talk today is a bit about the way how we let's say work on housing. And what you see already is that, uh, okay, compact city is in Europe something else than in Asia, but uh, let's say we are very much as an office interested in the uh, production of uh, prototypical solutions because we think, uh, I mean, uh, it's a bit strange idea to be try to make interesting architecture. It's, I think, much more interesting to and try to work on a certain topic and try to see architecture as a sort of uh, uh, product, especially in housing, that uh, is, um, I think, very interesting because uh, the question is always in housing, how can you produce with uh, a limited uh, amount of means a sort of maximum of quality? And we're all aware that the means are limited, but the question is what means quality uh, nowadays. But before I start, I will just quickly show you a little bit what we, what we do more in the office. So we have an office in, in Rotterdam with a quite international team. And let's say the issue we're dealing with is always the question how can you combine the, let's say, the cheapness of 21st century with the rich uh, history of our profession? And that's a sort of, uh, yeah daily question in the work of the office and uh, in the last years we have been working on let's say uh, a couple of uh, public uh, commissions so and, and different let's say 
and this is, this is a new building in Austria for a concert hall that we do also quite a lot of uh, transformation of uh, historical uh, monuments and uh, sometimes also myths. And in the moment we yeah, work, let's say, more for especially uh, in universities and we do also several uh, big scale uh, school buildings and uh, also uh, on, um, transformations of existing buildings in uh, existing contexts. And when I talk about housing, I, to be honest, I'm not a big fan of housing. Yeah? Because I think when you are an architect, uh, uh, or let's say, as an architect, I think that I always wonder if housing at the end belongs to the world of architecture. Because of the fact, when you think, what is architecture? Architecture should deal with proportion, should deal with space, uh, and should deal with, uh, let's say, the precise use of materials. And when you look at housing, you find out that this is very difficult because the issue of proportion is not really an issue in housing. Very often, you have already predefined uh, solutions that you have to use. It's basically adding, and we see all with housing a little bit more as a sort of uh, social service. But uh, also the social service is somehow okay, huh? because I think you have an education and at least you can offer something to normal people because you think it's quite okay to try to, uh, uh, yeah, to do something for ordinary people. And uh, uh, in a way, I mean, housing is a very uh, uh, political issue. Especially for us, because we grow up in the East, and in the East, Eastern Europe, I mean, the housing was always, um, yeah, let's say, something where you could show the future. It was the materialization of the dream of the future. And, uh, and very often, I mean, this dream was not so exciting at the end. But what we see at the moment, because of the fact that uh, in Europe a lot of uh, cities are uh, growing at the moment, that there is uh, an enormous need of housing at the moment, and we see that the issue of housing is becoming more and more political again somehow. Huh? And let's say when we were kids, we always were wondering about the poor quality of contemporary housing in the, in the 70s. And we always had the idea, OK, when we were architects, we could make something different. And when you get a bit older, you find out, OK, yeah. You look again on a photo like this, and you think, maybe not so bad. Huh? At least done with uh, someone. And uh, what for us is really confusing is that the issue of uh, contemporary housing is uh, very confusing, because there are a lot of contradictions, and we have somehow, as architects, to deal with this kind of contradictions. Huh? And uh, I just made a sort of simple list what we have to deal with. And you see, for instance, yeah, the relation between ecology and economy, for instance, an interesting one, or specific and uh, neutral, but also individuality and collectivity. So there are a lot of these kind of uh, themes that are somehow at the core of uh, the development of uh, uh, interesting uh, housing solutions. And I would like to show is what I, what I will do now. I just will quickly show you uh, uh, some prototypical uh, solutions. And I included also, you see, in the last issue, the refurbishment of slab housing. This is not really belonging to the type of to the prototype uh, thing, but it's also an issue I would like shortly. To mention, I mean the the first project is and that's I think a very Dutch one in a way is a project for uh, strip housing in uh, Amsterdam, and let's say the the reason why we are interested in, in, in housing, and that's actually, by the way, a diagram of the city of uh, Geneva, is the question that, I mean, as an architect, you always look for possibilities. And as I already said, there is an enormous need uh, 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 for housing at the moment, because uh, production was too low in the last uh, uh, decades. So that means there is uh, a lot to do. You can survive, and there is maybe also the possibility to invent something. Because it's always like that, and the pressure is high enough, then there is also space for architecture. And, uh, but it's not only about production. I think, let's say, what we think is an important issue uh, when you look 
uh, on the uh, let's say on the European condition. Then you see that I mean the last since the 50s, the development of European cities was very much defined by the development of suburbia. So that means the main cities didn't grow anymore. People moved to the countryside, 50 kilometers away, bought a house, and we're going every day by car to the city center. And we see that this lifestyle seems to be over because people cannot afford anymore two cars. Uh, both partners have to work because you cannot live off the salary of only one partner. And it means that suburbia is in Europe now, nowadays, very much under pressure. And a lot of people move from the countryside back into the, into the city centers. And that you see actually everywhere, you see it in Hamburg, Cologne, Antwerp, uh, Brussels, and so on. Huh? That's, I think, the, the new thing. And the question is for us, let's say, what our, our point is, actually, uh, I would like to make is that a lot, a lot of people that come back to the city centers have this kind of uh, suburban lifestyle. So you bring in also new expectations. So they don't want to live in an existence minimum housing. Yeah? They need, they want to have something else. And the question is, how can you implement uh, suburban qualities into the city centers. And uh, let's say we worked in the last years on a couple of these kind of projects, and for us, the, 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 as I already said, the, the combination of uh, economy and ecology, uh, ecology is a very uh, tough one. And seeing the fact that there is a very, uh, uh, yeah, very limited economical means, we always use a sort of I would say 1950s strategies from offices like Atelier 5, huh? where you say, okay, we just try to work with a smaller span and try to make a deep plan, reduce uh, the, the amount of uh, facade surface. By that, we can realize a bit higher quality and we have a bit of claustrophobic situation and we just try to, let's say, open the situation by bringing in a lot of uh, light into the structure by using a lot of glass and by making holes into the floors and introducing void spaces. So very simple. I mean, you can see the test by really Corbusier, this kind of stuff. So it's a very, uh, I would say, uh, modernistic strategy. And the example I would like to show is a housing project in Amsterdam we did a couple of years. And then the issue was here to remove an existing apartment building and to build uh, 23 uh, townhouses. And uh, we organized the, the houses in a way that um, that we could find a clever solution for the parking. Because let's say the problem we have in Holland is that we cannot afford the parking garage for uh, terrace housing. And uh, but we had to realize a lot of places and we actually propose the typology of the drive in-house. But the drive in-house has always a disadvantage to block completely the, the, the ground floor on the street side and you cannot park on the street anymore because you so the drive in-house is actually not so smart. And what we did was we turned the drive in in-house uh, uh, 180 degrees around. So we had we put the street on the back side and we Park, a park on the back side of the house, so it means we have a free facade towards the street, and we have, uh, let's say, a kitchen on the ground floor and living room on the first floor. We combine both with a, with a void, and uh, and we let's say basically offer two different um, outside spaces. So you have a bit more collective garden at the front side, and you have a private terrace on the back side on top of the of the parking garage. So it's quite simple in a way. You see it also in the floor plans. So there's, uh, it's very uh, uh, straightforward. And, uh, and in, in our way of working, we are, let's say, also very much inspired by this kind of modernistic attitude, but also that what we learned in East Germany at the school. So it's very much based on a sort of rationalistic approach. So trying to make a good foundations very clear, trying to set up a very clear uh, skeleton and then just fill the skeleton with um, apartments. Um, we work a lot of, uh, with prefabricated uh, elements because when you work with repetition, then you can uh, use prefab. And prefab is very often, in terms of quality, better than when people do the work on site. And then you see the project, you see very rigid structure. So basically, you can still see the construction that we like a lot as a sort of basis for the organization of the, of the houses. And, uh, 
and one of the problems we, we are suffer, suffering a lot in housing is the, fa the fact that I already mentioned that it's not really architecture, so you have to introduce very often some clumsy tricks to keep the things together, and especially here you can see that because, let's say, when you, when you see from an ergonomical point of view, that what we did here as well is that you have to, yeah, we had an aluminum system for the facades, it was the, the best way to do these facades, but we had to use for the head facade steel plates, because they were cheaper than, uh, and, and more stable than aluminum. And on the back side, we had to use, or we could use, uh, wooden windows, because the windows were a bit uh, smaller. And then the question is how you bring all these kind of weird materials together, and you can make a brilliant uh, collage, and we don't like uh, so much collage, because when we were looking more for something that forms really a sort of uh, stable entity and at the end we, we decided to paint everything white because it was the only way to keep this mix of materials somehow uh, together. But it was also, also already a trick that was invented in the 1970s. <coughs> when you look on buildings by Schinkel, for instance, you see very often that the classicism already at that time was a very uh, cheap one. And, and let's say talking a bit about this, about suburban qualities you can see here on the on the on the east side of the facade towards the, the, the park, uh, these kind of big terraces that uh, still bring in a little bit suburbia into the into the city. And here you see the, the most surprising space in the entire project, the uh, parking garage. And um, and you see that I mean, even if the houses are small, the, the, the inside measure is four meter or fifty, that it's still light and open and uh, a quite nice place um, to live. And um, what we do quite often in these housing projects is that we, we in terms of building physics, uh, it's always not so easy. Eh? You have to, because you have to tune quite a lot to get building permissions to build these apartments like that, but very often at the end, two years later, we make, uh, uh, we send people a letter and just ask them about the houses just to find out uh, if the things work like expected, and we do that uh, for two reasons. One reason is uh, yeah, you can learn a bit if the calculations and the expectations you had are right, but on the other hand, it's also super smart uh, in the discussion with the clients because very often the clients pretend that they know everything. And if you show something like that, then they say, okay, fuck it. <laughs> and they have not, they, you can have really a sort of clear argumentation why people like certain things and why they don't like certain things. And let's say we all always have this kind of fascination for the production of these neutral gray, uh, 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 prototypical solutions. And we were very happy that this project was included into the new not thought because it fits very much <laughs> into our way of thinking too. And let's say that and at the moment we do a, a new uh, uh, low scale housing project quite compact, <coughs> even more compact actually by the way, uh, in Arnhem and uh, yeah, there will construction is installed next month. The next thing I would like to show was a sort of study commission we had for the city of Groningen, but I think it was an interesting uh, uh, question, that's why I would like to show the, the project here. Because the, the city of Groningen is a city in the north of Holland with about 100,000 inhabitants, and they decided, okay, we need a bit more compact city, yeah? we don't want to have really a lot of uh, growth on the outside, but they noticed that uh, people were not so interested to live in apartment buildings because they have a lot of apartment buildings and they said if we want to attract people or if we want to convince people to stay in the city we have to offer more individualized housing in high density. It was a sort of interesting, I think, an interesting uh, question. And uh, also a bit typical for Holland because I want you see this question quite often and they had a quite a nice uh, site close to the, to the city center and the question they had was actually quite insane because they said yeah okay when, when you look on 
on the diagram on the left hand side that you see it's a normal density of uh, the raised housing uh, estates in Europe. It's about 35, 40, 30 houses per hectare. Uh, that's maximum. And then they said, yeah, actually what we want is basically the double. So they said, we want to have uh, low-rise housing, but with double density. And then, yeah, you, then you come up with the diagram, the second diagram, and then you see that the distance between the houses is so small that you cannot imagine any more people could live there. And then we tried to find the organization how to manage. And what we actually uh, proposed was a sort of double uh, building block, also not something that was completely new, because I think in Amsterdam, in the 1920s, you have already housing projects using a similar uh, system. And, uh, and the interesting thing was that we, let's say, with this kind of housing block, we could make terraced houses, and the ring on the outside was orientated to the park, and the ring on the inside would be uh, orientated towards the courtyard, and it produced uh, this section. So you make the houses on the outer ring a bit bigger and on the small ring a little bit smaller with an interior street six meters uh, wide. And it was actually the model we produced. And you see a little bit how that uh, could work. And so the uh, distance between the block was, block was about uh, 25 uh, uh, meters. And and we see the, the zone that we use for the access of the apartment, six meters, six meters wide. And uh, actually, we, we, we tried quite hard to do it. So we, we, we actually we had two projects where we, <laughs> where we tried to make it. And with one, we were already very close, but then we had to, then it was canceled. It was a bit, uh, a bit of a pity, but uh, it was quite, uh, let's say, as an issue, was quite interesting. And let's say this kind of topology was also in terms of uh, Let's say how you look on it actually interesting because you don't know anymore do we talk about terraced housing or do we talk about apartments and it was in terms of interpretation of the government rules interesting one and because of that uh, it was also interesting to talk about let's say when you talk about energy you don't know anymore is this facade here is it really outside or is it already inside so it was also let me say this kind of typology offers also let's say some uh, possibilities for energy efficient uh, solutions. The next project I would like to show is um, the typology of the tower block. I would like to show a project in Zwollens, in the north of Amsterdam. And for us, um, let's say looking back on the, on the development of architecture in the 20th century, we are always very much fascinated by, by this image because, because of the difference we notice. Eh? Because when you look back on Le Corbusier, then uh, Corbusier, uh, let's say, proposed the Maison Domino as, uh, let's say, a radical solution uh, for housing. So you have floors, you have columns, and you have a staircase that formed somehow the, the, the basis and then he started with architecture. So it means he always used that system. Huh? It was more or less given for him. And then he started to design, huh? design facades and void spaces and so on. And in our case, it's different. Uh, let's say uh, yeah, we see this not so much as the basis to design, but we see it actually as architecture. So we think that maybe, uh, especially when you have no money, this is maybe uh, already enough and especially when you go to the to the uh, uh, a bit to the to the south to Greece or to southern Italy or to Egypt and so on you see this system very often as the, the, the basis principle for the production of, uh, of housing. And we think there's a lot of quality in it because you have you see there's a sort of freedom you can imagine very different kind of uses and we think that's an interesting quality that an architecture could have that you don't offer a fixed solution, but you offer basically freedom. And um, this is also to do with the next image, because I mean, in the 1920s, architects tried to, um, let's say, produce with their, with their design a lot of freedom for, for the inhabitants. 
that it opposes a certain lightness of, of, uh, of living. And I think this lightness somehow uh, uh, became reality because the Bauhaus turned directly into uh, IKEA. And um, yeah, and you see that the, the, or even in Europe, I mean, the lifestyle is becoming more and more uh, light and people become more and more flexible. And I think the difference between housing and office, for instance, is not so clear anymore as it was uh, 100 years ago. And now coming back to the tower, po tower block, I mean, if we had the chance, I think we like the tower block uh, very much because of the fact that the tower block is a very uh, efficient uh, typology. And whenever we have the chance to design uh, or propose it, a tower block like typology, we do, we do because uh, we know that uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, price, uh, quality relation, you can produce relatively okay designs with it. And let's say the strategy we use is again a uh, strategy of the, of the 50s, I would say, uh, where Let's say we try to make uh, deep uh, floor plans. We try to organize the apartments all along on the edges. We put the access in the middle of the block. So we have again a bit of sort of claustrophobic basis and we try to break this claustrophobic situation by opening the facade to the maximum. And we could do it in a relatively straightforward way in this housing project in Zwolle. And it's a mix of 50% uh, student housing, 50% uh, uh, social housing. And uh, we particularly like that project very much because, uh, because you can read in this project uh, two tendencies. On one hand, it's very much inspired by uh, our uh, love for rationalistic uh, uh, architecture, so when you close your eyes, you can still see a little bit of uh, Aldoasi and Omos, a little bit of Nice. And, uh, but on the other hand, when you look on, on the, let's say, especially on this kind of situations, then you see also that we are belonging a bit to the uh, uh, post-punk generation, so we like also very much this kind of anarchy in these in these projects. That there is a sort of freedom that you can do. That people have a sort of freedom to do something what they want. And that the facade is not, uh, let's say, an element that regulates the the relation between outside and inside. But in that case, more a sort of interface. Let's say where you can where you have sort of screen and you can let's say adapt the screen to your uh, personal uh, wishes. The project is actually very uh, simple to organize, and the good thing was that we had uh, even a little space over <coughs> in the middle of the block, so we could introduce a void through the whole uh, uh, project, which you can see here, actually, that's the void. And and on the ground floor, we made a double entrance wall, very simple. And then you get actually this uh, uh, section that is in reality uh, quite amazing because you come, you see the, the building project, and from the outside, you don't expect that there is a sort of bigger space that is open in the inside. And there yeah, again, a lot of repetition. That we, work, we try to work relatively close together with the industry to uh, find out on one hand how they think and on the other hand get relatively uh, low price for the products we uh, use. And it's in, in, the, in the beginning it was quite an investment to do it, but it's not normally built up certain knowledge and with the knowledge you uh, also a bit quicker and you'll see a little bit the, the detail and, um, and the interesting thing let's say about this project was that it was built for a relatively ordinary budget for social housing and it's a little, in terms of quality it's a far better than the stuff you normally uh, would get and, um, and what we like you can here in this project you can open 50% of the, of the facility 
and it means that the project in winter looks uh, yeah, quite hermetic, while in summer a lot of things in the windows are open and it's in dialogue with the surrounding. And let's say when you enter, you see here this uh, entrance wall, and then you, you come <laughs> to, the, to, to the normal floor, so when you leave the lift, you see this kind of uh, Situation, as you can see, I mean, in social housing, there there is not much money, so it was also for us very uh, painful <laughs> to to design this project because uh, yeah, we used not we did, we did, because the concrete you see is not in situ concrete; it's just the ordinary concrete uh, you get, and you have just industrial lighting, uh, very cheap uh, steel handrails, and uh, acoustic. Uh, ceiling and but still I think it's uh, relatively okay and uh, it was at least interesting to offer a little space to let's say to the people to share together and when you come there because especially it's uh, it's student, student housing there's a lot of things going on in the corridors and it's quite uh, it's, it's quite and what we like very much is that um, uh, let's say looking back on the history of uh, uh, modern housing architecture that when Mies van der Rohe built in the 1930, the Jugendhaushaus, was heavily attacked. Uh, and uh, it was a lot of people who pretend it was not possible to live there. And, uh, but nowadays you see that the loft uh, became very much uh, common sense. So when you go in whatever bookshop in the countryside, uh, they have always at least three or five books about lofts somewhere in Milan. Um, and the only question is what we have nowadays, how can we uh, afford this kind of uh, housing? And we're very happy that we could, let's say, make these kind of apartments. They are 100 square meter and people pay, I think, 540 euro uh, per month for these houses and it's Let's say for Holland, uh, <laughs> quite <laughs> quite amazing that you can get uh, that kind of quality. Uh, the next project is uh, a project in the Hague, again about strip housing, but this time about uh, this is a gallery uh, uh, typology. And let's say talking about uh, housing is also really strange because on one hand. Uh, uh, we always say minimalism is, is not a choice because you see that uh, uh, when you look back on production of architecture that money became less and less, so, uh, there's less to design and we can hardly, let's say when you see in this project there's not so much design then because you see everything, all standard products and you just put them in and that's it. And you see that as a sort of global tendency, so you take uh, everywhere the cheapest product and the housing project is finished. Huh? But, uh, but on the other hand, you also wonder uh, where the money disappeared. And we experienced it actually very clear in this housing project. It's, um, on the side was a housing block by uh, the famous Dutch architect Dudok. And the housing corporation decided to knock the block down. And uh, because uh, they couldn't renovate because the apartments were not deep enough and so on, not flexible and so on. And the strange thing was that uh, they asked to rebuild the same amount of houses, but uh, actually the size of the entire project was the double size of the uh, housing project of the dock, but they lived half of the people then in the 50s. So that means within uh, 60 years' time, everything was growing by factor war four. <laughs> But it's really insane. But, it, that, that, but this also, let's say, describes the other side that we became so rich that uh, within 60 years we could go from uh, 12 and a half square meter per person to 50. <laughs> and and then in the 50s they had maybe for, for these 100 houses they had maybe 10 cars, and now they have uh, 150. So and. Uh, so it was quite tough to do that, and um, yeah, and at the end we used a lot of know-how from the project I showed in, in Oslo to find a solution for the uh, for the parking, and we set the the project up as two parallel um, uh, strips, 
and um, in the slab we had on the on the ground floor maisonette housing. So we made duplexes um, at the ground floor level and on the uh, upper floors we could not avoid the gallery access um, apartments but we don't like not very much because you know that you have always a little bit of privacy problem especially if the, the gallery uh, or if the, especially if the apartment is only on one floor but uh, but it was actually the only way to manage within the costs. We learned also something about sustainability because the strange thing is that the project was so big that we could uh, use a, a, a geothermic installation. And uh, by that, we, by doing so, we understood that insulating the facades is not, let's say, so important and to put these machines because when you have these machines you can save so much energy that you can do with the facades what you, what you want. Yeah? So sometimes, and, and that's why we also think that let's say, the issue of uh, sustainability should be solved on the urban level and not with the architecture because it's far too complicated and it costs far too much uh, money. And then you see a bit how the project looks. And, uh, and again, a lot of uh, repetition big entrance in the in the middle and in that way in, in, let's say in this project we detailed uh, for the first time the, the facade really more or less independent from the from the structure and the interesting thing was because of the fact that the project is quite big the, we could also uh, put the guys from the industry a bit under pressure because everybody wanted to do it and uh, but that had actually two advantages. The first was that uh, uh, we could rebuild a, a big mock-up of one of the facade elements because the housing project was used for elderly people and the client was a bit nervous of the combination of uh, sliding doors and elderly people. And, and then we had the mock-up and then we, had, uh, we rented a bus from the elderly organization, went there with uh, 20 of elderly people and then they tested uh, the facade. And because of the fact that these elderly people are very often quite modernistic in mind, they were very enthusiastic and, <laughs> the, and then they climbed to say, okay, we do it. If the people can deal with it and they like it, we, we do it. And the other thing was that because of the fact that we used a lot of aluminium, we could redesign uh, the aluminium profiles the way uh, we wanted and just to get a bit more elegant uh, facility. And another issue was because of the fact that the project was very big, we could use the 70s technology, the famous uh, tunnel construction, and uh, by doing so we also could uh, reduce uh, the costs because of the fact that the construction of the entire project could be built with uh, only three months. It would normally take six months, and because of that it was uh, low actually. And we tried to uh, use the construction again as a direct basis for the organization of the apartment and try to make let's say within the construction community the rules. And, uh, and the funny thing was that the the housing uh, corporation was a little bit afraid of our anarchistic facade facade and then they said okay <laughs> and we have also a bit of money over so we give you also even money for curtains so <laughs> the, the curtains belong let's say <laughs> to the facade so when you rent an apartment uh, you have to rent it with these curtains but you have a, a second rail where you can put your <laughs> personal curtain <laughs> and but well, it was kind of nice and uh, here you see a little bit the, the, how it looks in detail and that was it. Entrance hall, staircase. And then you see the, the, the terraces on the on the first floor without plants actually. And then at the galleries on the on the upper floors. And this is something very Dutch and we <laughs> try to make the gallery a bit wider and to give people the uh, opportunity to occupy a part of the gallery and Dutch people do that because they just it belongs very much to the Dutch culture and it's it's okay for them I think. 
and you see with the interior, so you have a loft like situation, and on the ground floor you have uh, maisonette uh, housing, and here you see a bit of the curtains. And, uh, and we built at the moment in in Antwerp, a similar uh, project, but then for, let's say, for the free market, and it's a quite expensive uh, apartment, and it's actually the first time that we can use uh, uh, a sort of prefabricated uh, concrete facade. So we have uh, panels from up to four by four meter, so we are very close to <laughs> what our friends in Switzerland do, like dinner in dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and we could we, we could you know, and I think even in, in, in Belgium it's complicated, but we could do that because we had at the moment economical crisis in Holland, and we could find a Dutch company that was willing to do it, and we transport all the stuff from from Holland to to uh, uh, Belgium. And yeah, Belgium project will be next month uh, finished. And the interesting thing is that uh, I talked at the beginning a little bit about uh, suburbia. You make here apartments that are 120 square meter surface, and they have 60 square meter outside space in form of winter gardens. So it means that there are a lot of elderly people that bought their house, and they basically bring their garden into the city center. And, and you see a photograph of the terrace, so they all think between 10 and 12 meter, and then two and a half meter and deep. And you can now uh, you can open them up and you have them on both sides, so it's quite uh, it's quite nice. So we are actually extremely happy that uh, that happened. And because my partner Andre was working on the project, and I always make jokes about it. He said, oh, "You will never make that. <laughs> it will be impossible." And then, so the moment was so quick that <laughs> that really happened. So it was quite we were really lucky. And uh, and we just uh, recently won uh, uh, another competition in in, in, in Germany. We have to, we will all again work with the gallery, but this time in combination with uh, duplex, where we try to really make family houses in uh, high density, and now we hope that we can build it uh, soon. The next project I would like to show is uh, a bit a strange one, because it's not really housing, it's something um, yeah, in between housing and hotel. It's a sort of project for heroin addicted in Amsterdam. And um, we are very much inspired also by the issue of healthcare, just because of the fact that, uh, uh, just the fact that the European population is getting older and older, it will change a lot uh, the, let's say, the architecture. And I think there are really new solutions uh, for housing uh, possible because of this country. Because you can suffer from it, you can say, oh, fuck, we have to do only wheelchair apartment and so on. But I think also the level of typology, this will produce new types of housing because we need uh, much more uh, uh, flexibility and adaptability um, of apartment projects. And, and we already, from the beginning of the office, proposed that because we had always the naive idea to say, okay, we offer a sort of uh, very simple loft-like basis, and then we say, okay, you can use this for filling in apartments in different size or office spaces. But nobody was really interested, and it had just simply to do with the fact that the market for housing and the market for offices is completely separate. So people do housing, they mostly don't do offices. And, uh, but the issue, but what, but what is interesting that in the, in, the, in the whole healthcare world, this is becoming close together, and the issue of flexibility, people also understand that they have to build more flexible structures. And the project we built in, in Amsterdam was actually organized very simple. It's a sort of a squarish plan based on a grid structure with commons. So we can basically, if, let's say, if they, if they want in 30 years, we can take out the complete interior and uh, uh, make a new arrangement. And then we have only one floor, and that's it. And so we have a very simple structure. It's uh, based on uh, columns. And because of the fact that we had to do a lot of smaller spaces, and all the spaces 
wanted to find a place on the facade. We had on the inside always a little bit of a sort of void because we had to make we had to fill this garage block. It was given in the in the early plan. So we proposed to make a, a, a big uh, living room in the middle of the of the project. It's nine by nine by uh, nine. And on the top of the of this living room, we put a little parts in allowing people to go to the outside. Inside. And there were also some specific con conditions regarding the facade because the fact that there uh, are heroin addicted people living in the room, they were not allowed to open the window. So we had to make, uh, we had to design basically a building like a refrigerator. And um, and we also were wondering what that would mean for the for the facade, and uh, and we quickly found out that we could not afford uh, structural glazing, so we used a sort of alternative uh, uh, system to fix the glass panels. So that was quite typical for our way of working because we talked to to a company that was specialized in that, and then we said, okay, we can fold this kind of aluminium plates to fix the glaze. But we said, actually, we don't want that this is folded, but we want to have them extruded. And the guy said, yeah, you know, you only take 1,500 kilo of aluminium. And uh, if you want to extrude them, you, I mean, it's only physical if you only work with three different profiles. And then we had a guy in the office who was a bit, uh, let's say, free for that. And, I said, with two guys, and I said, hey, come on, we should try to do it with three profiles, can you do it? And then they made the design the profiles, and basically we made the detail where we have uh, one vertical that you don't see, but you have those two profiles, and you see that on the top we turn them around, so we have only these three elements, and by that we could, let's say, uh, make this uh, facade with specially produced uh, profiles, very slender, and only like, uh, Five centimeter, and and we had a discussion with the housing corporations about these bands because they said we wanted to make a facade with, with bands, and brick was not uh, feasible. They didn't want to have uh, outside insulation, and then the question was what to do. And then we said, okay, maybe we can use a system with uh, glass tiles, and. But the, the glass tiles was, were far too expensive, especially when you use the Italian ones. And then we went on the uh, Alibaba tour. So we, we, we found a company in Amsterdam that, uh, let's say, uh, imported glass tiles from China. And with FedEx, you could we negotiate it with these guys. We get always more cups and so on. And then at the end, we brought the tiles in, 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 in China for, I think, uh, 20% of the, of the price of the Italian ones. And then this is really, the, let's say, that you only do because of the pressure, because the economic pressure is so strong that it was the only way to get it done at the end. You see the, the detailed facade, the courtyard on the, on the top. And, uh, and the, the space in the middle. How it is used. And again, the facade, facade is, it is separated from the from the structure, producing this kind of strange uh, space. I like quite a lot, and uh, we especially like the the Hannes Meyer way of living of the of the inhabitants because they really have nothing. They just take what they find on the street and live there. And it's quite, <laughs> it's quite uh, inspiring somehow. And um, actually do, let's say, work with similar uh, uh, typologies also in other projects. We had the moment work on, on a healthcare village in high in, in Belgium, where we do, uh, let's say, elderly housing, where we use atriums for, um, different collective um, uses. And we also worked a couple of years ago on a project for student housing in uh, Konium, where we try to stack uh, different kind of, of these kind of spaces to 
let's say, separate or indicate different communities within the world. At, uh, let's say, um, at a certain moment, the Dutch economy was very, started to become very bad. <laughs> I think 2009 or something. And, and then we said, okay, uh, the housing market completely collapsed because there were in Holland too much houses. And then we said, okay, we have to export our knowledge of housing if you want to survive. That was very simple. It's an economic question. But we also found out that we had to, had to adapt uh, to different local building cultures because in Europe there is not one building or living culture because when you look on every country, there are all, always things that are, let's say, different. And, um, Let's say this is one of our first uh, housing projects uh, abroad, a housing project in Paris. And it's also again, so the housing that we here proposed was to work with a, a winter garden as a basis uh, for the organization of the house. Because, uh, the, let's say, we like winter gardens quite a lot because they, especially in urban situations, they can function as a sort of climate buffer, but they also very often have a sort of noise protection uh, function, and they can give also a little bit more privacy on uh, outside uh, spaces. And especially in this project, it was uh, quite uh, important because we are very close to the Boulevard uh, territory in Moma. And, uh, we had to do uh, two very small uh, urban vill villas because it was not possible to change the urban plan. What's very, very often a problem in a lot of countries that the, let's say, the urbanists basically define what we have to design, and then at the end you come and then you find out there's not so much to design anymore because everything is defined, designed by the urban urbanists, and actually should be the other way around. I mean, the architects should define the urbanism and not the urbanists. Uh, we proposed uh, two blocks with public functions at the ground floor and winter blocks at the top. And uh, you see the typical uh, French uh, floor plan. We could not really avoid, so you see here an extremely small, nasty staircase that you see in all uh, housing projects in Paris. And then here again, you have this typical. Uh, Housing typologies for France called T1, T2, T3, and T4 because basically 80% of the city are built with the same type of housing. But it's actually a very horrible <laughs> idea. And the only difference, let's say, we offered was the fact that we said, okay, we, we, we have to accept it. We cannot escape from it. And the only thing we said is, okay, we, what we do is we make a balcony all around. We make the balcony deeper and we make a double facade. And by that, you have a uh, uh, a sort of uh, uh, winter park, and we try to make the apartments as open as possible to, let's say, transform <coughs> these different situation in something that we could accept. Because that's because we there was not a moment to reinvent something new. And uh, what was interesting was that um, we were very much focusing on the, on the building method. French clients were completely irritated what we were doing, so we were really very much trying to uh, predefine already how uh, the, the builders had to build to get the project into costs. We tuned quite a lot, but at the end we could, uh, let's say, uh, uh, manage. And uh, we made actually apartments that are far more open than they usually are. And yeah, and I think also included the uh, better than what you normally find on the, on the housing market. So we have this kind of balcony all around. We have a double layer for noise protection, climate protection, and uh, yeah, the project's at the moment under construction. We are actually also really shocked about the building quality in France, because you can really, in France, you can really see what uh, 30 years of neoliberalism means uh, to Europe. It means that at the end, I mean, you really wonder if people on the building side know what you do because the knowledge is so poor that, uh, that I think the difference between North Africa and uh, uh, let's say France is not existing anymore. I mean, in terms of quality, we have also a project in Morocco, it's really the same. So we're, we're really shocked, let's say, <laughs> how that, uh, let's say, yeah, about the reality on the building side. but. Okay, we, we managed, and uh, this is a photograph from two weeks ago, so the blocks are 
uh, on the way of completion and receive it to, let's say, the facade with the, with the outside layer of the winter gardens. And, uh, uh, we are really looking forward to the result. The last project I would like to show is um, it's not really a typology, yeah? but it is a sort of uh, a thing uh, when you talk about metropolitan housing, uh, a thing that is very important because uh, it's the issue of uh, refurbishment of the core ensemble. Because what we see is that. Uh, I think since the, since, the, since the 70s, we see already that the percentage of transformation project is uh, growing like hell, while the, the new uh, projects are really uh, going down. So especially in Holland, I think the, 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 the peak was in the 1970s. They built in Holland 250,000 apartments per year. And at the moment, they talk about uh, coming boom. <laughs> So it's going a little bit better. We talk now about building 40,000 per year. So you see that uh, the product production since the last 40 years really went down by uh, uh, 8%, 70%. While uh, transformation is becoming more and more an issue for quality reasons, but also for sustainability. And that there's also the new gas. Empty estates and in terms of techniques, and we have a lot of uh, uh, problems to tackle. But um, refurbishment means nowadays also something else than, uh, than in the past, because it, I think in the, in the past it was relatively easy to. Uh, renovate the building and to adapt to new conditions, but nowadays we see there are a lot of norms and regulations that become stronger and stronger, and they are not only for new buildings but also for existing ones. And what we see is the, the, the gap between, let's say, what the government wants and what you can do is becoming bigger and bigger. And that is, let's say, immense pressure for this kind of project. And in the office we do from time to time this kind of refurbishment uh, project. We more or less by accident got in 2002 uh, a commission for the refurbishment of 800 apartments in, in Holland. It was for us a very uh, disappointing project uh, on one hand because we could do so little, but on the other hand we learned really a lot by doing it. So it was, it was a sort of quite tough school to work on that project. And uh, what I would like to show quickly is a project we do at the moment in Antwerp where, let's say, we could lose actually a lot of knowledge from the past and we can go much further than we could go in the project that we just showed. And this is let's say, a project for the refurbishment of two uh, slab buildings. And uh, they are from the 1970s and they completely run down. And actually the housing corporation wanted to knock them down, but then they found out that when they would put them in a knockdown, that they could only build up to four floors. And they said, no, 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 we should keep them. <laughs> because otherwise we cannot build enough houses. And, and the houses have quite uh, some problems in terms of how the uh, access is organized, because it's really strange because this is the, the this is the front side of the apartments, but the access is basically on the back side, hardly to be seen from the outside, and it's from a social point of view quite uh, tricky. And uh, yeah, the, the, the galleries have closed uh, balustrades, but the apartments have actually quite a nice view on the, on, the, uh, on the landscape. And what we actually do is very simple, just show you some of the diagrams that we have in the buildings, a floor plan, somehow like that. And what we do is we uh, uh, demolish the complete, the entire interior, we take everything uh, out. But we also uh, demolish the staircase and, uh, and the stairs to organize that a little bit in a, in a more logical way. So what we actually keep, the only thing we keep is the skeleton. And then we put new cores on the, on the head facade of the building. By doing so, we can orientate the, the entrance halls towards uh, the 
street and we put uh, uh, balconies on the east side all around the block. And by doing so, we can give the apartments also a big outside space where they don't have in the moment. And what we very quite, like quite a lot is the next step. By doing that, we can even take out the, we can even change the construction. So we take out the, the, the concrete walls that are necessary for the stability because we put them now on the outside. So it means we take out these walls and we put those ones. But we do it in two steps. So we put first the core and then take it out because otherwise the structure would uh, collapse. And then we get a relatively uh, flexible basis uh, in between and we fill in different types of housing according to these you know, stupid regulations that we have to use that again offer not so much uh, freedom. And uh, now that's actually the situation at the moment. So we're just. Uh, on the way to removing everything, and we are actually super enthusiastic because you see that let's say, the demolition can be also quite fun. And what we do is that we let's say wrap the, the facades with uh, um, glass balconies and a lot of uh, glass plates. You see it here, and you see the, the new entrance halls towards the street, and the apartments on the ground floor the exit from the street, and then you see the balconies on the on the upper floors. We see a little bit the detailing of the entrance situation and the adaption of the galleries and the interior, new interior of the you know, apartments with the glass balconies. And uh, that is another project where we actually have a completely different situation here. We basically try to keep everything that's made for me. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, uh, Oliver, there's so much to see. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. The amount of work. So, so well, maybe uh, I have a very interesting way. I have a very silly question, more on the detail level, which is maybe not so important. I was wondering, now the last project you showed, the transformation of the building, is it because it's economically also viable, or is it purely because the rule of not being able to rebuild it that makes it an option? I think this project is actually very, for us, a very cynical one. Because uh, let's say that we have to we keep the, the, the uh, apartments because of the building regulations. Because if they would knock down the, the buildings, they were not allowed to get higher than uh, four floors. So by that, they would lose a lot of units. And because of the fact that they need the units, they keep the structure. But from an economic point of view, this project is completely insane because uh, we have actually the same budget, even more than the housing slab in The Hague. And, uh, <laughs> but it has to do with this kind of funny way how the uh, Flemish bureaucracy is organized. <laughs> you have this kind of, you have a famous uh, tabelle from the, from the housing corporation, and we are very smart in that, because you understood, okay, it's a bureaucratic way of designing, and we designed actually in a way that we could ever could get everywhere maximum money. So we first studied it, <laughs> and then we said, okay, we should try to get everywhere the maximum. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we, we put everything in to, to get the money. And, and, and what was also interesting was, let's say, that's a topic that I like really love, just the last detail I would like to mention about the project was that uh, actually, um, when you look on, uh, on refurbishment, then there is a law that you have to maintain 25% of the facades. To, because if you remove more than 25%, it's not a refurbishment anymore. And what we do is we remove actually uh, this facade and that facade. We keep the head facade, and it stays there, but in the end it will be covered. <laughs> and by doing so, it's still a uh, refurbishment. And, and that means that uh, the rules regarding energy are lower, and also for, for other stuff, and that was the only way to get it into this kind of to manage within really this jungle of regulations. So it is quite an interesting uh, issue.
But you see, let's say very often, that's a pro let's say, what we also understood, let's say, is that because we are working now for social housing corporations in Belgium, France, and in Germany, that in Holland there was an incredible freedom to design inspiring housing uh, buildings because the corporations had a lot of freedoms, while in the other countries everything is more or less pretty fun. And you have very yeah, less freedom, so you have not. Uh, because they say you basically what you have to do you have, can only design around the rules. Uh, I, I don't want to stick to this, of course, very beautiful anecdote about Belgium again, but um, maybe more in relationship to uh, our studio. So, metropolitan architecture and housing. And um, when we started the studio, uh, it was also mentioned by Christoph, I suppose, somehow the argument was. Metropolitan architecture, if you think about examples, it's not so easy, easily related to housing as such because you think of other constructions, maybe more related to uh, infrastructure, shared infrastructure and so forth. Now, of course, the challenge has been from the beginning to connect it with housing. Now, I must say, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprisingly, you gave seven types and each of them you seem to emphasize very consciously uh, on how the way people live, as being hyper-individual, if I could say like that, is almost a kind of meta-argument for uh, metropolitan housing, whatever that means. Uh, how, how do you see that yourself? Because okay, in the transformation here, of course, is of a 70s building with a certain idea of what the corridor is and the idea of the share. You were talking about how in Holland, perhaps, still people would like to beyond that kind of shared corridor and have a, a, a chair there. But Paris, from Antwerp and so forth, you have increasingly this idea that you are somewhere and you prefer being totally alone. Is that something you take very much as part of a project or you try to challenge that? I think at the end, it's, I mean, you can only design stuff that is somehow uh, possible, right? because I think it would be much interesting to think about more shared spaces and about more, let's say, facilities to organize communities within the city, like they do, for instance, in Vienna, where they have a sort of quite special housing program where these kind of, let's say, elements are included in the group. But what we see is, and I mean, the problem is I couldn't talk today really about it, but we, at the moment we are preparing something maybe for next year and it will actually deal with the issue of uh, neoliberalism and housing you know? and what we see is that uh, the production of housing is at the moment limited uh, by a lot of factors because we see that uh, investments are very often not bigger than 50 houses uh, the urban villa is the, seen as the most safest uh, solution uh, and we have only uh, uh, apartments in certain organization, only flat, no maisonettes and so on. And so everything in Europe turns to become the same. Right? So for instance, I was, uh, I mean, you architects tend to go always to the Vienna huh? because that's interesting, but I had this year in March the chance to go to the Mipin in, in Cannes, <laughs> the real estate <laughs> exhibition. And for me it was really a shock because uh, because the funny thing, the funny lesson from this exhibition was that the housing projects in Europe look everywhere the same, or even all the world, because you see everywhere the type of Paris-like urban villa uh, in different heights, uh, maybe six stories, four stories up to ten. But this is, that's it basically. There's nothing else. You see only this kind of typology, and the other typology you see is then a sort of terraced housing. And there's nothing yeah, in between. And it has, I think, to do with investment, it has also to do with security, and there's also, seems to be a sort of new image uh, what housing is in Europe. And I think it's quite uh, tricky, and it has to do with regulations, the finance structure, uh, energy rules, and so on. And, it's really difficult to imagine that uh, we, there will be a, that there will be again a sort of freedom like there was in the I mean, 60s and 70s where you could really invent uh, substantial uh, solutions. For instance, you have this kind of very nice book from modern, from modern housing prototypes from Harvard, I think, from, from the 70s. I mean, if you look through the book, you can actually throw it away because 80% of the solutions you cannot use anymore because. That way we are not so optimistic on the future of uh, housing because it seems that there's less and less uh, freedom.
Uh, you've been working last semester or so on, on scale, right? yeah. many houses. Do you see, for example, if you would shop yourself from your own seven types, do you see their elements uh, or fragments of an answer on the much bigger scale, let's say instead of 10 or 20, 700? Do you think every of these is valuable or, or, or there are certain thoughts you could share? I think we did basically the, the, the studio last year because of the fact that we are very much irritated about the way how the contemporary city is produced because you have this kind of uh, urban planners that make these plans and urban planners are very, I think from my point of view, very uninspired uh, uh, professionals because uh, the problem is that urban planners always pretend that they have knowledge of uh, the production of the city but they don't have the knowledge because I think the because the production of the city was always based on, on the fact that it was always a typological issue. There was always an idea about how could you produce the city, and it had always to do with lifestyle, economy, and so on. And the problem is that, uh, especially uh, seeing all these new regulations, yes, it's quite obvious that we need new typologies to uh, tackle the issue of housing, but you can only tackle these issues if there is a sort of influence from the bottom to the top, that means that urban planners with new type of that architects that invent new typologies make urban plans and that it is possible to realize these kind of typologies. Because if you, a, 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 a normal uh, urban planner has not so much knowledge about organization of houses, so he's always designing what is already there and limiting completely uh, all the possibilities. And then they ask you, and we have to very often in Germany that we are invited and they say, can you design affordable housing? I say, yeah, fuck you, you cannot design everything with this plan because if you have a block of 12 meter, I mean, you can never ever make something what is interesting. So you have to first develop the typologies and then try to think about what kind of, let's say, urbanism that produces. And then you have to make this, you have to check. And I think this is a bit the, the issue in that way, I think. That, because, you know, Cheap housing or economic housing is only possible if we have also a grip on the on the urban plan and on the bigger scale. Because basically, it's also a question of bigger scale. Because if you have a bigger development, then you know, I think the building prices also go dramatically down. Because, you know, because companies are really willing to to invest more time to do than to get it. I, I would love to go on with the conversation, but I think the, the Schinken uh, is, is already uh, uh, here. Uh, maybe we should already invite everybody for Schinken to come. <laughs> um, Oliver, thank you very much. Maybe afterwards, I, I just feel uh, the, we could maybe reconnect a little bit. No? Thank you very much.